All right, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Sandeep. I'm a PhD student co-advised by Sachin Kadi and Marco Pavone. And today I'll be discussing distributed perception and learning between robots in the cloud. So in other words, how can resource-constrained robots, such as low-power drones, use cloud computing services to improve their computer vision task performance? So today we're starting to see fleets of networked robots. And these fleets of robots range from low-power delivery drones all the way up to much larger self-driving vehicles. And these networked robots are starting to face two coupled challenges. So first, they're measuring growing volumes of very rich sensory data. So you can see on the top left of the screen an example of a LiDAR point cloud, which is used to localize different objects of interest during navigation. But coupled with LiDAR, autonomous vehicles also have several HD cameras to do video streaming and object detection and computer vision tasks. So this is an example actually from Stanford on my commute where you can see HD video is used to do um, object detection and computer vision tasks, but also semantic segmentation. So you can cluster different objects of interest that share the same label or category. So essentially to deal with this very rich sensory stream and vantage point of the physical world from multiple different cameras, robots are turning to increasingly compute and power hungry models. So in the case of computer vision, they might use deep neural networks. And a big trend in the art of deep learning is people are turning to very large models with several layers that are slow for inference, but also compute hungry, but very accurate. So my thesis focuses on how network connectivity can actually help robots. So if you go back to this example of a fleet of low power drones, they may see very rich sensory data. And to deal with this sensory data, they may have a local nominal robot model. So in the case of computer vision, this could be an object detection model called MobileNet that's very compute and power efficient to run. And it could actually run in your smartphone, for example. But it's not the most accurate. So suppose this drone is nominally uncertain for a high level sensing task, then it might send, or what's called offload, this image of interest to the cloud. So the cloud could be a group of central servers, or it can actually be an edge computing server. So people are talking about 5G networks. So in the future, in your cell tower, you could actually have very good compute to query very large deep learning models that are compute intensive. So it doesn't end there. In the cloud, you can access pre-computed maps or databases, say Google Images, but also use human annotation services or ask for help, for example. So the prime benefit of network connectivity in robotics is on better real-time inference results for computer vision. So that will be the first half of this talk. But if you look at, um, so that will be a distributed inference problem. But if you look at a different class of autonomous vehicles, say self-driving cars, they may not actually be compute or power limited. So they may have a very good bulky GPU on board. But still, network connectivity can actually help them profoundly. So this comes in the form of better specialized models. So robots can actually send interesting field data to the cloud. You can actually retrain models and adapt them to a robot's real-time operating conditions. So it's estimated that future self-driving cars will generate four terabytes of very rich sensory data in just an hour and a half. So even if a fraction of this was sent to the cloud, you can retrain models and improve computer vision task performance. So that problem of distributed learning will be the second half of this talk. Okay. So the key challenge here is you're using very precious system resources, stemming from congested network transfer up to human annotation time, cloud storage, as well as cloud computing time. And you need to split this across several different robots in the fleet. So this is the main challenge of this field, which is called cloud robotics. So again, this field of cloud robotics comes with some key challenges that are typically understated today. So let's go back to this first problem of distributed inference in real time between, say, a low power drone and a cloud computing server. So here, the problems are actually quite intuitive. First, you have to wait some time for network communication. So that's the first problem of network latency. But that's actually coupled with the slower inference time 
of using a larger deep neural net that's sitting in the cloud. And if you look at the second problem of distributed learning, as I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of data, about four terabytes per car in just one and a half hours. So even if a fraction of this was sent to the cloud from every robot, say every Tesla, <coughs> it takes some time to upload. It takes some time to annotate interesting examples. Uh, it adds to cloud storage cost and to retrain models. So these are end-to-end -end or holistic systems costs that need to be well mitigated. So the key theme of my research is to limit communication. So if we selectively but judiciously query the cloud, we can get the benefits of cloud computing in robotics, but with minimal end-to-end -end systems costs. Okay. So as I mentioned, the first half of this talk will be on a problem of distributed inference, so real-time computer vision between a robot and the cloud. And this is an offloading problem. So let's actually make this a bit more detailed. So if you go back to this fleet of drones, they may see a nominal scene of interest. And here, I've actually computed the object detections using Google's Edge TPU, or Tensor Processing Unit. So it's a dedicated AI accelerator running in a USB stick that's very fast and compute efficient. It's a very new product. So in 30 milliseconds, you can localize the major object in the scene, which is a human. But clearly, you can see there are many different objects of interest that are totally missed by this shallow model. So maybe you can query the cloud if you're uncertain. And for the very same image, you see many more detections, especially for far off objects. So, but this uh, incurs some delay of actually querying this cloud computing server, coupled with the slower <coughs> inference time. So the main contribution of our work is this offloading logic, which is a very concise and small neural network that's running on a drone that decides at every time step whether a robot should use a fast, responsive local model or it's highly uncertain and really needs the accuracy benefits of cloud computing. Okay. And in the second half of this talk, I'll actually build upon distributed inference in a very intuitive way. So if robots are already sending uncertain images to the cloud, can't you actually use them to retrain computer vision models and improve their performance in a nightly process, for example? So this is a problem of distributed learning and sampling interesting training data from robots. So if we go back to this example again, your robotic fleets see very interesting data during the course of a day. So these are all pictures from my commute to Stanford. So you may, may see a very well understood, say, freeway scene. But then you may come uh, across a new construction site with dynamic obstacles and roadblocks. So this was actually um, near the dish. And finally, you may see a novel visual concept that maybe your neural networks don't, see don't understand currently, such as the Waymo car. So today's naive solutions would store all of this data on board a robot. And actually, this could overrun storage on very small resource-constrained robots. And then you'd spend quite a lot of time uploading this over the network. You'd add to a terabyte size data set that's growing daily. Then you'd spend a fraction of time, uh, spend some time labeling even a fraction of this data. But then you could retrain a model, which takes cloud computing resources. But the benefit of this process is you can sync back an improved model to the robot for better performance during the next field test, for example. So what I'll show is you can build a lightweight sampling algorithm that's actually very similar to the offloader. It's sitting on a resource-constrained robot that decides maybe you should filter out the somewhat boring, well-understood training data, keep the interesting training data, so that you can still get the benefits of retraining a model, but with minimal end-to-end -end systems costs, stemming from the network, but actually culminating in cloud computing time. So this is a problem of intelligent sampling, and they build upon each other. Okay? So at this time, I can give an outline for my talk. So I'll start with a motivation about using cloud computing and robotics in the context of using these deep neural networks. And then I'll actually switch to a physical network, which is a wireless network, and the costs of streaming this high bitrate sensory data to the cloud. I'll describe these two problems that build upon each other, and then I'll end with future directions in network control. So the first question of interest is, what is the accuracy gap between a robot model and the cloud model? Is there actually some benefit of actually using cloud computing and robotics? Okay. 
So to answer this question, we should understand some real, very recent trends in, an, uh, in embedded AI. So on the left pane, you see a video that's being processed by the Google Edge Tensor Processing Unit. So it's a lightweight USB stick, and it's running at 70 frames per second. But just a couple years ago, I would be stuck with this generic ARM CPU, and it's going at an order of magnitude slower. So clearly, the capability of embedded AI for these low-power drones is becoming faster, cheaper, and more power efficient. But inference latency is not the only figure of merit. What you care about is the relative accuracy gap between a robot model and a cloud model. Okay? So I showed this picture before. And you can see that these cloud-grade models can clearly uh, localize far-off objects much better. And if you look across a very large data set, there's actually a fundamental trade-off in the size of a neural network which is the last column, so how many layers and parameters the network has, uh, with the inference time, so how slow it is for one image, or its inference latency, and the accuracy. So the accuracy metric here is the MAP, or the mean average precision. So it's saying how close is a bounding box to the ground truth, coupled with did I get the label correct. And a general rule of thumb is these cloud grade models, which are in the bottom row, are an order of magnitude larger and slower, but double the accuracy. And you can see here there are actually economic trade-offs. So let's say I have the money for just two cloud GPUs. Maybe I can actually be running one in your future cell tower. And with the money for the other GPU, I'll actually provision 10 lightweight drones with edge TPUs, and they'll be using both computations seamlessly. Right? So robots shouldn't be stuck with just the left model, but should have the best of both worlds algorithmically. So we can actually make this more clear through actually footage from my dash cam and my commute. So again, this is near the dish. And there's a very large construction site for over six months at Stanford. And I collected uh, quite a lot of data here. So you can see at the uh, end of this video, or towards the end, you actually see an excavator or a tractor. And on the left, you see the compute efficient model, which is MobileNet. And it actually takes nine seconds longer to localize this tractor because it needs to get very close. But on the right panel, you see that a cloud-grade model can see it from the get-go, initially. So an ideal solution would actually interleave both computations. So it would query the cloud server and say, hey, there's actually a far-off tractor, beware, and then track it efficiently on device. So let's actually watch this video. So you can see. Only nine seconds later, it realizes, hey, indeed, there's an excavator here. But on the right panel, with a very stable bounding box, you localize this using a more compute-intensive machine learning model. So robots can actually have the best of both worlds algorithmically. And I'll show that next. So at this point of the talk, I've actually motivated, there's actually some benefit of using cloud computing and robotics in the context of using a deep neural net. But what are the costs? So what are the costs of getting to the cloud? So can we actually experimentally quantify these costs? So some of these costs are very intuitive to us. We already know that we always have very congested wireless links. You have problems with video streaming while um, maybe at home or on the move. But if we dig deeper, there are actually more nuanced uh, reasons for this. So our cellular networks today are built asymmetrically. So there's limited capacity to stream to the cloud, so uplink as opposed to download, which we typically do today. And the second reason is actually quite interesting. Today's video streaming protocols are fundamentally designed for human perception. So they assume the downstream consumer is the human eye. So they want to faithfully reconstruct every single pixel in the scene. So imagine a world where most video that's actually sent over the internet is never watched by the human eye or your eye, but actually by a deep neural network or a robot. You could actually crop out or automatically learn what are the salient parts of an image, send much less over the air, but get the same sensing task accuracy. So if you're interested in this problem, we have a very small vision paper in the networking community about this. It's about neural networks meeting physical or wireless networks. So we wanted to test this problem of streaming to the cloud out experimentally for another sensing modality of interest in robotics, which is LiDAR. So you could do a very simple example, um, actually at uh, home or at Stanford. So 
This actually comes uh, from Marco's class, where uh, they have several robots and many students have, were streaming data from, say, Velodyne LiDAR sensors to a central server. But the general idea is you have a LiDAR sensor and an embedded GPU, and you can stream these large point clouds to a central server to do computation. And the question is, how well can you do this using today's default autonomy stack in robotics, which is ROS, or the Robot Operating System? So if I send uh, LiDAR point clouds to a server, they're actually fairly large. They come at 70 megabits per second, which could be handled by today's Wi-Fi networks. So let's see how this actually pans out using ROS. So at the source, in blue, as expected, you're sending steadily at 70 megabits per second. But as I connect more robots and actually increase congestion on the network from right to left, you see some very puzzling results. So you can see in purple that if you just send from two robots simultaneously, a single robot sees less than half the data it was intended to see. So this may be puzzling at first, but uh, if you look uh, carefully, ROS was built in very somewhat antiquated Python code for at least this part. So it's not built for high performance networking or streaming, so you could fix that. Or unlike video, which I showed on the previous slide, there are not well-established standards for compression and streaming of LiDAR streams. So you could spend several years to build this standard. It actually took us several years in industry to do, do this for video streaming. But what I'll propose is a very simple algorithmic solution. So if you can learn to be intelligent about what computation you do on the robot, but selectively query the cloud, you can get the benefits of both worlds, but with limited network bandwidth utilization. Okay. So this is a problem that's not talked about much in robotics, but actually practitioners online are facing these problems. Okay. So at this point, I've motivated the benefits of using cloud computing, but the costs, so let's actually build this <coughs> inference platform. So again, this problem of real-time computer vision is how a robot can seamlessly integrate both local and cloud computation. So the main contribution of our work is to view cloud offloading as a problem of sequential model selection under uncertainty. So I'll show how you can build this offloading neural network that's sitting on a robot's embedded GPU and deciding at every time step whether it should use a fast, responsive local compute model or it's highly uncertain and needs the cloud. And I'll show actually that this offloading neural network is 18 times smaller than even MobileNet here, and is extremely uh, fast for real-time inference. So how do we build this system? Well, um, to first understand how you can mathematically characterize this problem, you can actually view uh, offloading as a problem of sequential model selection and actually an op optimal control problem under uncertainty. So let's see why. So let's take a very simple example of streaming face recognition from video. So here, the goal is I want to localize every single human face here and say who the person is. So if I see and use free, uh, frame of video, I may want to use my nominal robot model. But then on the very next frame of video, there's a lot of temporal coherence. So those faces will persist. So rather than drain power by running my robot model once again, I can just use past predictions that I've saved in memory. Then finally, as the video continues, if I see someone totally new, then maybe I want to query the cloud. So this action of querying the cloud actually comes with a fundamental constraint and a limit. Suppose every robot has a fair share. They can only query the cloud, say, 5% of the time. Then given this budget, but also uncertainty about what the robot will see in the future, it needs to be smart about whether I should really query the cloud. And this limits the bandwidth utilization across the fleet. So the goal of this decision-making process is to choose an optimal action, which is what is the right model to use currently based on a robot's real-time uncertainty and operating conditions. So ideally, you want to use past predictions, which are very fast. They could be uh, potentially stale, however. So if I'm somewhat uncertain, I may want to query the robot model. But this drains some power, but it's more accurate. But then if I'm fi finally highly uncertain, I really want to query the cloud, but this decrements my budget by one, so I have limited room to query the cloud in the future when I might be really uncertain. So the state space in this problem guides what is the right action to choose at every time point. So I'll make this much more precise mathematically on the next slide. 
but the ideas are very intuitive. Ideally, I want to know how much is the sensory input changing. So notice here, I'm showing the difference between two successive frames of video. Most of the background's not changing, and that's why it's black. So if the video is not changing much, I may want to use past predictions, but they could be old. And then if I want to query the cloud, I need to know what budget remains and how much time do I have to allocate it. And that's about it. And the goal of this decision-making procedure is you want to maximize accuracy, but at the very same time, minimize the cost and latency of querying these different models. So it turns out it's very hard to model the dynamics of a wireless network, but also what the robot will see in the future, so how the video evolves. So we turn to model-free learning methods for control, specifically deep reinforcement learning, with this key budgetary constraint that there are limited queries to the cloud that a robot must judiciously use. So now I'll actually present this learning-based approach. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with deep reinforcement learning, but I'll give a very simple example. So here you have an agent, which is our offloading policy. It's a neural network that's sitting on the robot's GPU. It measures some sensory state, S of T, which it uses to guide what is the right action, A of T, to use. So in our case, the actions are what are the right models to use at a given time point. In order to control this uncertain environment, whose dynamics are not unknown initially, and the goal is through interaction and trial and error, you want to optimize or the performance, so you want to maximize this control performance metric, which is your reward, R of T. So why am I actually using RL in this problem? Well, it turns out RL works quite well in problems where there are key exploration versus exploitation trade-offs, and it's actually inherent to this problem. So I want to exploit my on-robot computation as much as possible, but I also don't want to miss out on what the cloud will tell me. How good will a cloud-based result be? I can't analytically model that, but I can, I can learn that through interaction and learning during a training phase. The second reason is, again, it's very hard to model the, the dynamics of the system, both of the wireless link, but also of the video. Okay, so at this point, I'll show how you can build this offloading policy, which is an RL net agent that's 18 times smaller than mobile net. It takes in some, time, some state S of T. It has a very simple action space, ideally past robot or cloud predictions, action zero or one. If you're nominally uncertain, query your pre-trained mobile net. If you're highly uncertain, query the cloud, and you tune this decision-making procedure using a reward function that trades off accuracy with inference latency. So I'll set this up as a Markov decision process, or an MDP, because it's an optimal control problem. So I'll go through the states, actions, rewards, and dynamics in detail. So the first question of interest is, what are the robot and cloud models? <coughs> so we actually choose separ separate and modular robot and cloud, cloud models that don't necessarily need to be neural nets. All they are are machine learning models with a different trade-off between model complexity and inference latency. And they take a new image, x of t, and map it to a set of bounding boxes or predictions and confidences. And the benefit of modularity is actually quite uh, clear. So if the network times out, I'm not stuck. I can always default to local computation. And the goal is to have general machine learning paradigms. Okay? So I described the action space um, before, but it's actually quite intuitive. It ranges from simple past predictions to all the way to querying the cloud. And by virtue of having four very succinct actions, you can build a small offloading neural net that, is, can, that can be run in real time on hardware. And of course, if the network times out, you can stick to local computation. So the main question is, given these robot and cloud models, how do I actually figure out which is the right one to use? So that governs our state space, which informs this decision-making procedure. So this might seem like a somewhat complex equation, but actually there are only four underlying concepts that are very similar. So first, I need to know how much has the visual input changed over time. So I can take the difference between two frames of video, sum that pixel difference, and if most of the background is black, like I showed before, then that's a scalar proxy for dynamism. So if the video is not changing much, then I want to ideally use past predictions, but I need to store my memory. So the next two elements are what do stored or past predictions stay? Okay. 
So not only do I need to know what the past predictions were, I need to know how old or stale they could be. So those are the time lags, which are the next two components. And then finally, if I'm highly uncertain and I want to query the cloud, I need to know what budget remains and how long I have to allocate this in order to figure out what is the right use of cloud computing at a given operating condition. And that's it. So notice here the state space doesn't actually peek into a new frame of video. That's actually delegated to this pre-trained neural net. So by having a very small state and action space, you can build this very concise RL agent that can be run in hardware with minimal overhead. Okay? So again, the goal of this decision-making procedure is I want to maximize accuracy, but at the same time minimize systems cost. So what are these systems costs? Well, you can actually rigorously define them from experiments based on your own operating conditions and your own platform. So I showed this table before that trades off the inference time of a neural net and its size. So you could say roughly, if I'm querying the cloud, then maybe um, due to the round trip time and the slower inference time, action three of querying the cloud is 15 times more expensive than a simply, simple memory lookup. And you can tune this across various platforms based on your robot. Okay? So at this point, I've set up this MDP. Let's actually move into hardware experiments on an actual platform. So we, this is a general algorithm, but we tested it out on streaming face recognition from video. So you can create a bunch of synthetic videos, millions of them in fact, um, by splicing together different faces of interest. Train your R RL agent and fine tune it on real videos. So how might this go? Well, a face will show up for some time. There's some coherence pattern. You may see someone new. And then for the robot model, you'll use FaceNet. It's a de facto neural net for face recognition. It's present in all your iPhones. And then if you're highly uncertain, only then would you query the cloud. And the process repeats. So I can train this RL agent in simulation, fine tune it on an actual platform, and deploy it on new videos. So these are our experimental results. The RL agent in blue is running on an NVIDIA GPU. And each episode here is one of 500 test episodes over real wireless links. And this is the performance. So what do I actually care for in this problem? Well, I want to maximize my reward. Namely, I want to maximize accuracy, which is on the y-axis, but at the same time minimize systems costs, which is on your x-axis. So in green, you see an upper bound solution. So this is an oracle where at the robot, if you perfectly knew what the cloud would say, but also perfectly what the robot would see in the future, there's no uncertainty. So this is the best you can do. But you can see the RL agent is quite close to that. But more importantly, it beats by over two times benchmarks in gray that you would use in robotics today. So today you might say, I don't care about cloud computing and robotics, so I would take perhaps a lower accuracy, but a very low latency, a lower systems cost. Or you could say, maybe I want to query the cloud, but I'll think of a simple heuristic. I don't care about RL. So anytime I'm less than 60% confident on the robot, I'll query the cloud. Otherwise, I'll just stick with local computation and find the optimal threshold. But this actually doesn't exploit a key property of video that there's temporal coherence. So I can leverage past predictions, which RL does, and that's why it does so much better. And finally, you could say, I really want to query the cloud, but let's say I have a budget of 10% of the time. So I can only query the cloud 10% of the time. So every 10th frame, I'll ping that server and just keep uh, past predictions intermittently. Then uh, you'll get this performance. But it turns out RL is much better because it's intelligent. So it learns when to judiciously pack in queries during periods of high uncertainty. And that's why it interleaves better both local computation in red and cloud computation in yellow seamlessly on the same video. Okay? So you can test this out on very small robotic platforms, but it uh, generally works quite well. And you can build this compact RL offloader. And uh, if you want uh, more details on this, you could see our paper with uh, a lot of Marco students. So James is the author on this paper too. Okay. So at this point, I'll switch tracks and actually go much faster in a very uh, simple problem on distributed learning. And it directly builds upon real-time computer vision, which is the first time. So if I'm already uncertain and sending ima interesting images to the cloud, can I not actually exploit those to retrain a model so I mitigate this uncertainty later with a better model? 
So it's fairly intuitive that learning rare events can actually improve your decision-making models in robotics. So if I know that there's an abrupt construction site, maybe I can think of a robotic ways that automatically updates HD maps or signals this to other robots. Or I may see a new novel visual event that I should maybe retrain my net on. But the key inside of our work is to actually view today's robots as distributed but passive collectors of training data. So there's a lot of work on active perception in robotics. Where should the robot move next to maximize information gain? But let's say I have a fleet of Teslas and I have volunteers, which we actually do at Stanford. Maybe I have no control about where the person is driving, but let's say they see something new. Maybe if every Tesla sent 1% of interesting images it saw per day, I can crowdsource interesting visual information from field robots. The main idea of using just 1% is by virtue of intelligent sampling, I minimize how much I upload, perhaps when the Tesla is charging at night, how much I store, how much I annotate and recompute on. And this minimizes end-to-end -end systems bottlenecks. And you can think of many other examples why this may be useful. Mars ro robots, robots where the network is actually a big uh, problem. You can think of how they prioritize interesting field data. And in this part of the talk, I'll actually mirror the first half quite uh, similarly. So what is the benefit of using the cloud? Do I actually need to use the cloud to specialize these models? At what, at what cost does it come? And how can I build this sampling logic that can run on hardware that gives you the benefits of both with minimal costs? Right? So the first question of interest is, why should I even specialize computer vision models? Are default computer, computer vision models not good enough? Well, um, this is a picture from my commute near the dish again. So you can see here, this image was run through Coco, a Coco pre-trained model. So I downloaded it from Google, and it's trained on uh, the common objects and context vocabulary. So this can recognize everything from a toothbrush to an apple, but doesn't quite know what a traffic cone is. So it makes a mistake and calls it a person. And in fact, this excavator here is neither like a bus nor a car, so it's totally missed. But you can see this is our retrain model that with very little cost corrects these errors. Okay? So we can actually make this more precise. So if you watch this video, you'll notice that the default model on the left m makes a mistake and calls every single traffic cone present a person. Right? So you can see this for all of these, right? And you can see our retrain model is more domain specific and specialized, but it actually corrects all these errors. Right? So the second reason why you want to retrain models is that the real world is constantly changing and I want robots to crowdsource this information. So on day one at Stanford, they're excavating the road. So you can see that there's a big tractor that's digging up the soil. But there's a lot of real time model drift that you can see. So at the right panel, Within a couple of weeks, they're totally different trucks. They're actually filling in the road using this asphalt compactor, and actually a human is filling in part of it. But on my commute, you also see various uh, um, interesting patterns. So I may pass by Google, and I'll see a Waymo car. And no neural net today can recognize Waymo cars or LiDAR units, publicly at least. But with little data, you can do this. This is our custom model. But then the real world changes. So I may not see the Waymo car, but on Highway 85, I'll see yet another startup self-driving car. So the point of this is the real world is changing. And can we not have robots reflect this? You can think of very diff uh, different applications, robotic ways, for example. So clearly, there's some benefit in retraining our computer vision models in the cloud. But at what cost does it come? Right? So the main cost is actually annotation. So I had a very small data set from my own dash cam clips. But still, computationally, there are over, right now, 500,000 images to automatically mine. So you might ask, why don't I just randomly select 1% of this data? Well, it turns out it's still very expensive to label. We paid the Google Cloud labeling service to do this because it was just too much for us to do. And you can see this is one image that Google labeled for me, and it has over 20 bounding boxes. So if you do the numbers at this rate, this is exorbitant. It's not uh, feasible on a research budget. But if you do this for autonomous cars, it's several hundreds of thousands of dollars per month, or even millions, end-to-end um, -end costs. We've actually talked to several startups that are facing acute 
cloud computing costs, which are kind of unintuitive, unintuitive in robotics. So I'll show how you can actually do this on free credits for about $400 by automatically sampling, but intelligently. So the key question is, how might I actually do that? Right? So the first um, idea or, uh, of interest is that you may actually need very few or minimal images. So on the y-axis is the final accuracy of a machine learning model. And on the x-axis is how much data did I use to train this neural net. But what you can see is that there's a key law of diminishing returns for most static visual concepts. <coughs> so what I mean by that is maybe to learn what the Waymo car is, I just need 10% of data. And after some time, the marginal gains in accuracy are outweighed by the high systems costs of going out into the field and acquiring these samples. But as I showed before, for these dynamic targets, which are constantly changing, maybe you need quite a lot of data, like the construction sites. And again, you can think of examples where robots crowdsource this in an automated way. So the second uh, question of interest is, given that perhaps I only need 10% of visual data, how can I automatically select this from a neural net sitting on board a drone or a, or a robot, right? So the key idea here is I can use transfer learning. So I can get a pre-trained neural net from Google. It may recognize toothbrushes and such, but it can be augmented to learn new classes with a few examples of Waymo cars or LiDAR units, okay? So I can train this neural net with an augmented vocabulary to recognize these new visual concepts. And then when I train this net, I can build a data-driven filter. So the output of this net is a softmax probability, which is saying um, what is the confidence score for being a Waymo car in red. So I look at all my Waymo cars that are actual Waymo cars in red and say what is the confidence. There are often is an empirical cutoff between background noise. So in blue are irrelevant images, different types of cars or flowers, for example. So you can maybe build some proxy of maybe this looks like a Waymo car. Or you can use embedding distances. So embeddings are compact visual descriptors. They're intermediate layers of a neural net. And often empirically, you can see the distance between two flowers may be much lower than a flower and a car, for example. So this can kind of help me signal whether there's some signal of interest from background noise of millions of images. The key idea here is you actually get embeddings and these confidence scores for free during inference. So just by running the neural net, I get these simple numbers. I can do comparisons and kind of uh, crowdsource or select what data I care for. So this may be a little confusing, and I'll make it more clear on the next slide. Right? So our learning happens in days or rounds I. So at the start, maybe some human in the cloud looks at this video and says, hey, I don't uh, know traffic cones so well. Maybe I need more pictures of construction sites. Hey, robotic fleet of Teslas find me more such examples. So you actually send a limited amount of these images to your cars. But not only that, you train a new neural network with the augmented label saying, I have a few examples of Waymo cars that I can scrape online. Let me send you a neural net trained on those to nominally recognize them. And by virtue of training this net, I can build a filter that differentiates signal in red from background noise in blue. And you send these thresholds to the robot. Then the robot is tasked with a very simple and easy problem. Given this new neural net and a set of target images, it may see some new video and it says, hey, does this sort of look like a Waymo car? If so, I can, um, uh, if so, if it passes the threshold, then I can save it on board, upload it at the end of the night. And interestingly, there's a human in the loop that looks at these filtered prioritized examples, retrains the neural network, and syncs it back to the robot. And if you do this over several days, on day one, you might be quite uncertain about what do you actually care for from noise. But as you accrue more data and use feedback from a human in the loop, you do much better. So the key notion of cloud feedback here. So I don't have time to go through the full paper, but it's about this intelligent sampling logic that can actually fit on a USB stick. So imagine you actually send them to volunteers, which we're doing. So um, let's actually get into the results. So our system is called HarvestNet. It's in orange, because we're trying to harvest interesting information to retrain a neural network. And what do you care about in this problem? You want to maximize accuracy in the fewest amount of days. 
So every single one of these sampling schemes are extremely cache limited. So they only upload 200 images per night. So you can think of random schemes that aren't so good, but our system does fairly well compared to an oracle that has no uncertainty. And the key idea here is by using feedback from a human and by adjusting these thresholds, I do met much better than non-adaptive schemes, but send very little data that minimizes your end-to-end -end systems cost. Okay? So these are more examples of this. So currently, we're actually trying to build this out on very simple home robotics platforms. So we have a team of what's called federated Roombas, some at UCSD, some here at Stanford. And the idea is you can have an edge TPU running real-time inference and prioritizing interesting data. So this is actually a picture from my home. And you can see default models work fairly well for a bit. And then they totally break apart on, uh, as the Roomba moves around. So imagine every Roomba in every house could send 10% of uh, interesting data. There are also privacy questions. You can, just like I built a neural net that selectively uploads data, I can build a neural net that throws away any pictures of a human being in any of these, okay? So we're doing this with Tesla, Tesla dash cam data as well. And if any of you have a Tesla and want to volunteer, um, that would be great, okay. So at this point, I'm almost done. So um, I'll finish very quickly <coughs> on future directions. So this is my desk in Gates, and you can see here, this is the computer vision. Uh, first pa part of this talk was done in this large, bulky GPU, and now it's just a USB stick. So clearly, embedded AI is getting faster, cheaper, and more power efficient. So you might ask, why do I, need, why do I even care about cloud computing? Well, the cloud will always have a role. You can collate or data from several robots at a time. You can use human labeling services. You can retrain models. And finally, you can use pre-computed databases that simply won't fit on board your drone or this really small USB stick. So there's interesting contention about what I should do on the robot and what should I do in the cloud. And that was the whole premise of this research. Okay? The next question is, how should we design video streaming if we know that you will never watch this video, but maybe a deep neural net sitting in the cloud? Ideally, I could send much less over the air and get the same sensing task accuracy by co-designing the way I represent data with the downstream task. So for those who are interested in a little bit more theoretical machine learning, here are some very simple but um, preliminary results. So I can say, let me take a new image X of T, compress it aggressively to send over a wireless link, and then decode it, okay? So typical machine learning would stop here. You'd say, I care about how good the reconstruction loss is. But perhaps I don't care about a faithful reconstruction. I care about how good that image is for downstream control, or maybe even inference. So I can push, push the loss function to the right. And by fixing this neural net and co-designing the two, you can see you can be very aggressive in compression. So you can send much less over the air. So these are just very small examples from MNIST and get very high compression ratios. The next question is, embedded AI is getting better. So imagine robots that are severely network limited, maybe on Mars or under sea or in mines. DARPA has a subterranean challenge, for example. If embedded AI is getting better, they measure a lot of data. data. Maybe they can retrain models on device. So this is a concept called federated learning. But we have some variants of it, because in federated learning, you never actually leak private data to a cloud. But here, a robot, if it's uncertain, needs to sometimes send data. So how can we send safe data, retrain models on device with minimal interaction with a human? And finally, there are problems in network control across data boundaries. So today, I limited how much data I send purely because of network bandwidth utilization problems. I actually uh, worked at a startup. So imagine if AT&T gets a lot of interesting network data. We were doing downstream control, so you might ask, how do I send private forecasts to, say, Uber, for example, and limit the scope and volume of how much data I share across a private data boundary? So these are all my papers. If you're interested, um, you should definitely talk. And this is, it's in this general space of robot cloud interaction. Cool. Yeah, thanks. What were the returns like? I assume it wasn't linear. Like I uh, yeah, so the budget is um, the robot has a budget about how many times it can query the cloud. 
s ranging from, say, 5% of the time up to 50. So these are emulating different wireless link conditions. I trained the RL agent on a wide variety of budgets and actually tested. That's why my plot had a distribution on returns. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, we can sort of um, <coughs> compress images yeah. and not have them as higher quality. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you think it's still feasible to have cloud computing if we want higher quality images? Because there's some research that shows higher quality images are good for, let's say, like pseudo LiDAR neural network methods. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so definitely cloud computing can help in what's called super resolution, so enhancing the quality of an image. What more I was talking about was on the communication part. So oftentimes in uh, sensing tasks, a lot of the background is irrelevant. So let's say I want to do automated license plate detection. Maybe I don't care about background trees and such. So that I can compress much less, but also store less on a cloud server. So there are two facets of it. One is super resolution, as you mentioned, enhancing which has a role. This is for the communication part. Uh, I've seen a few articles out of like Chinese state media pushing 5G. Yeah. And uh, I've seen articles, a lot of them, about how it's going to revolutionize robotics that's not even mobile, like manipulation and stuff. Could you talk about how you see 5G affecting the stuff you've worked on? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. So 5G is about massive data rates at low latency, right? So here I talked about a large amount of sensory data. But imagine if I had very low latency or network delay, I can actually do control in the loop, so teleoperation. So one thing I know that people um, are thinking about in China is like ma manufacturing floors, where Wi-Fi is a limited commodity. It's, uh, there are tons of robots, humans using Wi-Fi on the manufacturing floor. You may have small Roomba-like things doing logistics, but you have a central server. So imagine if you can teleoperate these robots, but also um, the notion of a cloud could be a human has who has abstract bandwidth to query the robot. There's machine-to-machine -machine, uh, protocols in 5G. So 5G will just enhance everything here, I hope. <laughs>